those days so long ago now when skies were turned In 1942, an a Lancaster bomber flies over Chiltern Gardens. Heavy bombing raids against Germany now became more frequent. I, for one, I know, I thought, well, he's getting day what he deserves, and uh, if it will shorten the war, I think it should be done. Although at the same time, there's no doubt many of us felt that it was wrong. By November, there was a growing sense that the tide was beginning to turn. In North Africa, the 8th Army defeated Rommel at El Alamein. But if spirits got a lift, the stomach got no such comfort. The Battle of the Atlantic continued. And to save on wheat imports, the Ministry of Food produced the national loaf. As Ruth Mott recalls, it wasn't popular. It was so dry always um, because, of course, they've left so much more in it uh, than when we have our bread like today. We used to rub it through a sieve sometimes and try and get some of the husk out of it. But it dried so quickly, it was quite nice if you ate it today when it came. But the next day... It it was very dry. A greater percentage of wheat germ was left in the bread, reducing the amount of flour used. A lot of effort went into persuading people that the loaf was good for them. Chorus girls at the Windmill Theatre were photographed eating it. But to the British, brought up on a diet of fine white bread, the coarse grey loaf remained unappetising. Yet the British passion for a cooked breakfast remained as strong as ever even if the ingredients included the national loaf and a new arrival, reconstituted egg. Ah, here's a date for you. No, I'm sorry, this is the date I meant, December 14th. Now you can get your new lot of dried egg. Here's the date, and here's the tin, and there's that other date. The war stimulated research into techniques for dehydrating food. Put into practice, this saved huge amounts of shipping space. Powdered egg from North America now replaced shell eggs. Each person got a tin a month, the equivalent of 12 eggs. Well, I think like everything else, you grabbed it with glee and thought you'd got something. They, it was very nice, really, dried egg. A lot of people still say they liked dry egg. Um, it helped you make the cakes, you could make an omelette with it, you could make scrambled egg. It did eke out your egg ration if you hadn't got any other source of eggs available. At Chiltern Gardens, the battle against pests continues. With a shortage of pesticides, vigilance was the best defence. Harry Dodson nips an old enemy in the bud. This wretched thing, black fly, broad bean black fly, and one seldom gets away without it appearing, especially in a gardens like this. You've got to be very vigilant at a little bit earlier than this, although these were free of it last weekend. And as soon as you see it, you want to take the tops out. Removing these soft tops at about this length is sufficient to, to stop it spreading. It's a, it's a messy job to do all together, but uh, it pays, otherwise it gets under the bean, and the beans were, wouldn't be very pleasing to the cook, and certainly no use to the market. In country areas, there was always plenty of fresh vegetables, but it was often difficult to get fish. The fishing industry was hard-pressed, 
The best of its boats had been requisitioned by the Navy, and the fish that was caught was sold close to where it was landed. As supply couldn't be guaranteed, fish was never rationed. First come, first served, produced long queues. We queued for everything in the war. We took no notice of it at all. It was something that developed in the war. And if you saw a queue, you hung on the back of it, whether you knew what it was or not, and tried to find out as you shuffled along what you were queuing for. Hello. Hello. Oh, what a day. Went at 10, back at 4. Oh, looks like it too, the state of this table. It's not that bad. Fish became more readily available fashion. with the arrival of fresh salted cod from Iceland. Here you are. How about that? That's a nice bit of fish. Where did you get that from? Up Smelly Alley. It's quite nice. Fish is highly perishable, but once salted, it could be more widely distributed. In promoting it, the Ministry of Food emphasised it was fresh, not dried. But cooks found it needed a good soaking, creative recipes and plenty of garnish. After an overnight soaking to remove the salt, the cod is ready for baking. Right, Joyce, hurry up with those nettles, won't you? Well, it didn't really come into the villages at all. We used to go into the town for it. It didn't come into the town every day, but most days would be something in one of the fish shops. And of course, you've got a choice of uh, several of them in, in those days. It wasn't very delicate fish as a rule. It was usually sort of cod or herrings, sprats, perhaps things like that, and salt cod, if there was some available. Cook them just like spinach with about a um, quarter of a pan full of water, I think a little bit of salt, and uh, pop them in very quickly. Uh, don't leave them in too long so that they keep a nice bright green. If you just feel them between your first finger and your thumb and they sort of split easy, then they're ready to dish up. Nettles were not only eaten, they were also important in the treatment of asthma. The country's stock of drugs was becoming dangerously low and nettles were on the list of wild plants the government wanted collected. Most of the things you reckon to eat and finish there and then, sort of thing. Don't try and save any for tonight or tomorrow. Just uh, eat it and enjoy it, who you knows, as much as you could. The nation's hen population was facing its own crisis, the growing scarcity of feed. I'm sorry, madam. I'm only allowed to supply you with your ration of poultry food. I know it's small, You'd better see the Ministry of Agriculture. All right. Good afternoon. I appreciate your predicament, Mrs. White, but you'll be glad to hear that we found the solution. The government have organised a nationwide collection of household scrap to be turned into chicken feed. It's ration-free and it solves the poultry keeper's problems. You'll do your bit, I know. If human beings will do theirs and save every bit of scrap they can, I know they will. Good day. And please accept this small token of gratitude on behalf of the hens. Oh, 
hello, Joyce. I bought your chicken swill. Oh, that's wonderful. Thanks. Oh, gosh, that looks good, doesn't it? Yes, it's got um, bits of cabbage in it, breadcrumbs and bacon rind and all the scraps. Let's go and have a look at the chickens, then. Are they laying all right? Yep, they're doing really well. Oh, yes. How often do they lay, then? Um, it's usually one each a day. Oh, so how many are there? Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, that's very good. Six? Hmm. You can spare a couple then. <laughs> For you, Joyce, yes. Here you go then. Thanks. Right, and now you must come with me because I've got something else to show you. Really? Hmm. Then. Need a few more though, won't you? Oh, I'll get some more. Look, you see these little spoons? A bucket of mushrooms from the Anderson shelter may not have been a feast, but it was a small luxury for the family and a triumph for the gardener. Oh, I know what I wanted to ask you. Yes. Have you been to see that film yet, The Great Day? No. It's not about. It's about a land girl and um, she gets involved with this rich young farmer. He's very keen and he marches her off to the past. Ooh, and... I'll keep my fingers crossed there. How are we doing? We ought to get over to the Ten Acre before dinner. If we're lucky. Ooh. Look here, you better take a rest. Run along home and get some sleep. No, I'm all right. Oh, you're up most of the night with the carving. Oh, that's nothing. It was thrilling. Thrilling? <laughs> I'd like to hear one of the men call it that. <laughs> You know, you've done something to this farm, Margaret. Demoralised it. Rejuvenated it. And me. Made everything seem new and exciting. Just like my first spring here. Keep it like that, won't you? I hope so. By 1943, land girls had earned the grudging admiration of their employers. Some had even decided that they couldn't face returning to the city when the war was over, despite the heavy work that went with life on the land. Garden routine could be lonely and monotonous, but when there was a chance to work together, singing popular songs helped pass the time. I know a daddy naughty as a fruitcake, goofy as a goon, and silly as a loon. Some call it pretty, others call it crazy, but they all sing this tune. Dozy dots and dozy dots and little Andy divey, a kiddly divey too, wouldn't you? Yes, Mandy dots and dozy dots and little Andy divey, a kiddly divey too, wouldn't you? If the words sound queer and funny to your ear, a little bit jumbled and jivey. Sing mares eat oats and does eat oats and little lambs eat ivy. Oh, mares eat oats and does eat oats and little lambs eat ivy. A kiddly divey too, wouldn't you? A kiddly divey too, wouldn't you? Now there were over 10,000 women working in private gardens. The war was making them question their traditional roles. One contributor to the Land Girl magazine declared it her ambition to buy a farm when it was all over. That day got a little nearer in the summer of 1943 when the Allies landed on the beaches of Italy. Underneath the lamplight by the barricades Darling, I remember the way you used to wait was there that you whispered tenderly that you loved me, you'd always be my lily of the lamplight, my own. Mrs. 
Frances Roosevelt, continuing her investigation of Britain at war and especially the work of women, visited Barham in Kent. Here she saw fine examples of local produce and among other introductions, she met a pig which rejoiced in the name of Franklin and a hare called Eleanor. As the Allies battled in Italy, the wife of the American president watched another army prepare itself for action. The members of the Women's Institute gathered to preserve the autumn fruit harvest. The Ministry of Food was concerned at the amount of fruit rotting in orchards. It set up fruit preservation centres run by the WI. Each year in village halls and farmhouse kitchens, members made jam and bottled fruit. America sent over 500 portable canning machines. Now it was a case of eat what you can, can what you can't. Fruit was packed into tin cans and boiling water or syrup poured over the contents. Then the lid was put in place and the can slotted into the machine. Rollers joined the lid to the can in a continuous seam. A precise 20 turns of the handle were necessary to complete the operation. I thought it was a wonderful implement. Uh, I think it could be used today quite a lot if you wanted it to. Uh, it was easy, I thought, when once you just sort of learnt to count to 20, you were all right. Sterilisation was the main thing. When you'd got your canning done and you'd got your lids on, they all went into the boiling water for so long so that they'd heated right through. If you hadn't done this properly, of course, after a little while the lids would blow. Labelling was very important, whether it was fruit in tins or vegetables, because if so happened that you put your labels on and you hadn't really got enough adhesive to them, they fell off and then you didn't know what you'd really got. So you used to pick up the tin and shake it and think, oh yes, that's plums. Only to find when you opened it, you'd got carrots. It was hot, tedious work. And if there were grumbles about the sugar given to the preservation centres, the results fully justified the allocation. Orders came for sailing somewhere over there All confined to barracks was more than I could bear I knew you were waiting in the street I heard your feet but could not meet My lily of the lamplight My own Resting in the billet just behind the line Even though we've parted, your lips are close to mine You wait where that lantern softly beams By September, the leaves on the tobacco plant are ready for picking. Harry hangs them up to cure in the dry atmosphere of the potting shed. They must rise slowly and naturally and not put them in a glass house or somewhere where they're going to dry quickly. The usual thing to do after that was to take them to a tobacconist who would shred them up for you for rolling up to make cigarettes or if you wanted it for a pipe, he would cut it coarser for the pipe. As autumn gets into its stride, Annie starts on the job that land girls hated most in the garden. Picking sprouts is not one of the jobs that I would volunteer to do if I could help it. 
Well, the leaves are stripped off and then you should start at the bottom of the stem. And with a couple of fingers below the sprout and the thumb on the top, you bend them down or bend them sideways and they should snap off. But that's, that's the theory. It doesn't always work like that. Sometimes you'll find the stem where the sprout is very tough on there. And uh, if you've got many like it, it is a laborious job and it makes the tips of the fingers quite tender. And if it's a cold and frosty morning, it's not pleasant at all. Nineteen forty three ended with the Allies making slow but steady progress in Italy, and there was much talk of a second front being launched in the new year. Did you manage to get all that order of sprouts, Pete? Yes, I did, Mr. Dodson. Oh, thanks. They're all Good. in the greenhouse now. Oh, thank you very much. Good night then. Good night, Annie. Good night. See you in the Thank morning. You. When we look back now to years gone by, to a dark and stormy the song 